Good to see you guys this morning. How many of you have already seen that video? So if you don't know what that is, that is an actual court hearing. That was the attorney who apparently when he was in the, you know how you do a waiting room on Zoom, maybe you don't know, but you're just kind of waiting. And when he popped into the meeting, somehow a cat filter was on. The funniest part to me is him saying to the judge, I'm not a cat. Like, like somehow the judge would be like, this cat has joined our meeting this morning. And then the other funny thing is how calm the judge is. He's just like, I know you're not a cat. I can see that you're here. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> it's awesome. So anyway, that guy's become kind of a celebrity. He did a, did a whole little thing. He's just a normal, normal person who apparently did not know how to run a computer. Now, here's the tie-in to that video, and here you go. Today, we're going to talk about confession. There's two types of confession. Number one, we know about when it comes to sin, confessing sin in our lives. But the other part is confessing the truth about who God has made you. Both are confession. And so um, in sin confession, there's sins of commission, that's sins you've done, and there's sins of omission, things that you should be doing that you refuse to do. You say no to God in areas. But then when it comes to confession, you know, that guy's like, I'm not a cat. See, here's what the enemy does to you. The enemy will try to convince you that, that you are not who God made you to be. And so in, when God convicts us, it's very specific. For example, God may say, you, need a, you, you may sense in your heart, it's not out loud, but you may realize, you know what, I, I need to go apologize to so-and-so for something I said. So, but when the enemy comes and attacks us, it's things like you're a terrible father, you're a terrible person, you're ter it's things you can't do anything about. When God convicts you, there's an action you can take through confession or making things right. And so understand that when you're dealing with this. Let me ask you a question today. What do you see yourself as? Do you see yourself as just a sinner? Do you see yourself as just a... Maybe you see yourself as an unhealthy person. We're going to talk about these areas of prayer, and today I want to encourage you to make sure that you're not putting on a filter that says, I'm better. I don't have any... Man, I'm just great with everybody. I never do anything wrong. I, you know, Or the filter that the enemy wants you to have, which is, I can't do anything right. I never get things right. I'm a failure. And you may be listening to one of those voices. I, we've all had those times where we feel like a failure. And so today, as I talk about this part of confession, I want to encourage you in your time of prayer to, to pay attention to what you're even telling yourself or that even the enemy is telling you. So here we go. Here's a simple pattern for prayer. We're talking about ACTS, A-C-T-S. Take time to do adoration. And I talked about this last week. It can be as simple as going out to the beach and and saying, God, thank you for all that you've made. And knowing that he is awesome and powerful and mighty and all the things that God is, that's adoration. Confession, uh, like Rodney said earlier, Rodney, great job as usual, by the way. We appreciate you. Um, as Rodney said earlier, it's about you and God. It's about not about you confessing other people's sins or trying to make them right with God, but it's about you being honest about your relationship with God. And then we'll, next, uh, next week, we're going to have Father's Day. So we'll have a Father's Day message. Then we're going to talk about Thanksgiving. And then we're going to go to uh, supplication. Here's the key. The key is to use God's word to hear and obey his voice as you pray. The number one way to hear God is as you read his word. Because when you read God's word, by the way, whenever you think you're hearing from God, make sure that what you're hearing, and I mean hearing in a loose way, I don't mean Noah build an ark, right? But, but when you have a, a prompting, we call it a prompting of the spirit, something you should do, make sure it lines up with God's word. And I tip, people say to me, well, how do I know if that's God? I said, was it selfish or was it unselfish? You know, does it feel forced? Does it feel pressed? Do you feel pressure? Is it like you're in a used car salesman? Then that's probably not God. And so we have to be very careful. It should follow the fruits of the Spirit. Love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Now here's the hardest part of prayer. It's from Psalms 27, 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. And I think this is the number one mistake in prayer. That we just launch a bunch of things at God... And say, see you later. Instead of recognizing that prayer is you sitting in God's presence. Allowing God to lead you and to guide you, even in your prayers. Listen, when's the last time you were praying for somebody and you said, God, show me how to pray for them. So take time just to get still. This is the hardest thing 
not only in our society, but if you're like me and you have a slight attention deficit, you have a little concentration difficulty, it's even harder for you. But guess what? God made you. He can deal with that. Now, one of the things I've told people, um, people who are very hyper tend to also be more visual. Did you know that? And so because they're visual, sometimes uh, praying and imagining yourself coming before God helps you to be able to focus in prayer. Just a, a little side note, little lanyap for you there. Now, here's the thing. If we don't spend time in God's Word, if we don't spend time in prayer, we lose track of where we're at. Now, this is a level. This is my favorite level, and here's why. You ever hung a picture with two things on the back, and you got to try to measure it? you got to try to measure it, and you got to try to figure out where it goes, and then make it level and all that? This one lets you move these things to where those little things in the back go, and you can line it up on the back of the picture, and then you put it on the wall, and you put a little pin through it, and it'll mark the wall perfectly level. Now, let me tell you the problem with a level. My dad was a contractor, so his levels sometimes would get cement on them when we were doing a job. And if you weren't careful, you'd go to do the next job, and you'd lay that level down, and you'd think, that looked pretty level. And you look at the level, and you're like, that is way off. How is that so far off? And then you'd realize that concrete had gotten stuck to the bottom of your level and threw it off. Listen, sin in our lives, if we're not careful, will get the level off, and we'll think we're okay. Most of us know somebody who's gotten into a habit which is way beyond where they should be. Okay, we, I don't think anybody woke up one day, though, and said, you know what? I've just never done anything bad. I, I think I'll try heroin today, right? I, nobody does that. I think I'll be a raging alcoholic today. No, that's not how it works. How does it work? They make one small choice. They go to a party. They, they are in with some friends. They make one bad choice, and then what happens? Then they make another choice. And then they make another choice. And they think, during all this time, they think they're fine. And we've talked to people that we say, hey, we think you might have a problem. And they go, I don't have a problem. What happened? They've gotten used to where they're at. That's why in prayer, we need to have times of confession where we allow God to knock the cement off of our level. We read his word to discover what God wants us to do, not what the world tells us. Listen, the world will tell you, follow your desires. Jesus says, follow me. The world says, follow your desires. Jesus said, take up your cross. You ready for this? Deny yourself. What do you mean? I can't just do whatever I want? That's what Jesus meant. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. What does that mean? You mean I can't just do whatever I feel like doing? Right. I mean, you can, just don't call yourself a Christian. It's okay, just don't pretend you're a Christian. I want to do whatever I want and be a Christian. Well, then you're not a Christian. You can't say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you, but I'm going to follow the world too. And that's when sin gets involved in our lives. So let's look today to how do we allow God's Spirit to purify us from these old habits, these old ways as a Christian? How do we allow Him to purify us and to make sure we're agreeing with God? Because the other thing that can happen is you can be a Christian and think, I'm a terrible person, I'm a terrible mom, I'm a horrible... And the world comes in and tries to convince you that you're somebody you're not. They, Satan puts a filter on you and you have to say, I'm not a cat. Let's look at this idea of confession. So why should we practice confession? Number one, confession prepares you to hear God. In Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, it says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. What does that mean? God could save you if he wants to, but then it continues, Nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities, your sins, have separated you from your God, and your sin has hidden his face from you so that he will not here. If you're no longer hearing God, if you feel, feel far from God, guess who moved? He's the prodigal father just waiting for us to come home. So what do we got to do? We got to come home. We got to come home. There was a book written years ago by a rabbi who talked about how bad things happen to good people. And what he said was, well, God just can't control everything. So you're just going to have to be forgiving towards God. What? Now, Here's the truth in pain. We live in a sinful world. Have you realized this yet? So sin allows you to do dumb things. So if Suzanne wanted me to, to, to if she wanted to today, she could get up and just trip me. Right? She could, don't, don't, 
Dave, Dave threatened to pet, punch me last night. I told him he didn't have to. Right? So you're allowed to make a bad choice. Now, here's the other thing. Other people's sins can also affect you. Have you realized that yet? Most of us have had a neighbor, maybe a child, maybe a coworker, maybe a boss. And, and w- it wasn't something we did, but they attacked us. And we were hurt. Why? Because of someone else's sin. We live in a sinful world. I think even some of the cancers and other things we get, we'll find out down the road, hey, that's because so-and-so put this in the water. We're like, what? Why were they putting that in the water? Well, they thought it might be good. So what can we be responsible for? Where is my heart towards God? Have I been honest about my failures? Have I been honest about the things, the things that I don't do that I should do? And have I been honest about the things I do that I shouldn't do? The one who enters by the gate, I love this. Jesus says this. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd. That word shepherd literally means pastor or elder. By the way, in the Bible, pastor and elder are the same words. I think the reason that some, I'm going to be mean right now, I think the reason that some churches use the word elder is because they want to pretend that elder is a different station so that the elders don't have to have the same responsibility or accountability that a pastor does. But in the Bible, it's the exact same word. They should have the same accountability as a pastor and the same responsibility as a pastor. That includes hospitality, visiting people, all the things that that go in line with that. And so Jesus says this is who he is. He is the shepherd of the sheep. And then he says this, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and, listen, leads them out. I'll come back to that. When he has brought all of them on his own, he goes ahead of them and his sheep, what do they do? They follow him because they know his voice. So what would happen in, in New Testament times and in, early, uh, in Old Testament times too is at night sometimes they would lock all the sheep together. So you might have sheep from three or four different flocks together. And so they would open the gate and the, when the shepherd would call his sheep, only his sheep would come out the gate. Only his sheep trusted him and they would follow him. Now it's very different than what we do with hogs. My grandfather, I remember being about three years old, and he had this cane, and he would take it out to the hogs, and it had a little nail in the end, you can still see where it was, and he would scratch the hogs back, because they like to have their back scratched. And then when it was time for those guys to go to the slaughter, you know what he did? He had to put them on a trailer, and he'd get behind them, and he'd get that hog on the trailer. He could get it on the trailer. He wouldn't just call it, he would whack it, and it would go driving on on the trailer. Listen. Jesus, if you look at this illustration, it says he calls his own. He leads them out. He's not going to beat you into submission. He's not going to force you to follow him. You have to get still and listen to him. You have to spend time in his word. He doesn't make you do anything. Now, the Bible does say he disciplines those he loves. What does that mean? It means as a believer, when you sin and fall into sin, God allows us to have the, the consequences often of our choices, right? He disciplines us, but he leads. He doesn't push us. We have to get still. We have to listen. Number two, confession brings forgiveness. Matthew six fourteen and 15 says this, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is one of those verses that people tell me all the time. I wish I could take that one out of the Bible. Eric, do you think Jesus really meant that? Yes. But I think most people don't know what forgiveness is. Most people think forgiveness is forgetting. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that forgiveness is forgetting. Did you hear me? If you were, there's things that if they've happened to you, you should not forget them. They are to warn you that, that you don't want that to happen in the future. If somebody's hurt you, if somebody's attacked you, you, you want to be aware so you don't do that again. In order to forget it, you would have to have a frontal lobotomy or a bottle in front of me, one of the two, right? To try to forget it. So it's not about forgetting. What's it about? It's about not holding it against that person. So you say, God, I choose to forgive that person for what they did. Does it mean you lessen what they did? No. What they did is still terrible. Too often people say, well, it was no big deal. That's a lie, too. It was a big deal. When certain things happen to us, it's a big deal. And we have to recognize, you know what, God, that was a terrible thing that they did. But God, I choose to forgive them. 
Can I tell you something out about, else about forgiveness? You sometimes have to forgive more than once. I'll never forget, you know, my father, most of you know my father committed suicide when I was in college, beginning of my college time. And after my father committed suicide, I, I learned how to forgive him and I was able to forgive. And a few years later, when my son was born, I'll never forget, Kyle started walking. Now, Kyle is almost 30 years old now, so I can tell you I still remember this. And I remember getting mad and thinking, my dad could be here to see this. And I got angry. And you know what I had to do? You ready? I had to choose to forgive again. So forgiveness may not just be one time. You may have to forgive somebody, and then when something happens, you get frustrated again, then you choose to forgive them again. It's okay to go through that process of forgiveness. By the way, sometimes the person you need to forgive is you, because God forgave you. So you have to forgive yourself for the mistakes, for the dumb things you did. Anybody in here ever done anything dumb? Anybody? These are my people right here. They're all, you're my people. Okay. Yep. Listen to this, 2 Timothy 2.19. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. Listen, the Lord knows those who are His, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. So how do we do that? Kristen and I, a few years ago, went hiking. And before I went hiking, I looked up TripAdvisor about the different hikes. And I'm so glad I did. Because the first thing they said was, make sure you take a picture of the map when you get there. And I thought, well, that's silly. This can't be that hard of a trail, but I thought, I'll take a picture of the map. So I took a picture of the map, you know, the map says, you are here, right? So I knew where I was, and here's what's wild. We went hiking, it looked pretty easy, and as we got down to a certain place, there literally were like five trails. And I was like, uh, hang on. And I got my phone out, and I looked up the trail on the map, and then I said, oh, this is where we are, this is where we need to go. When you spend time in God's Word, the world will tell you, hey, as long as it feels good, do it. That's nothing new. That, they've been saying that for generations. I, there was a song about that when I was, you know, how can it be so wrong when it feels so right? Remember that one? Remember that one? And, you know, right, it's got to it's gotta be right because it's good. That's not what the world, that's what the world says. But what God says is, my, what I say in my word is what's true. What I say in my word is right. Where am I? What are the things? Where is my heart? And we have to get still and allow God. Listen, there are times that nobody else knows what you're thinking. Okay, that's all the time, right? So you can look at somebody and say something nice to them and in your brain be like, doofus. And God knows that. And when you're confessing sin and you're making things right, you know what? You can make that right with God. You don't have to go to them and go, by the way, I was thinking you were a doofus because now you just made them upset. But you confess it to whoever you said it to. So if it's gossip to somebody about somebody, you go to the person you gossiped to and you say, I'm sorry I said this about whoever. The good news is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from most of our unrighteousness. No, from all of our unrighteousness. Now, this is one of the places where the enemy will try to give you a cat filter. The enemy will say, oh, how can you call yourself a Christian after you did that? And here's what you can say to him. Just like Jesus did, Jesus quoted scripture, if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Say, no, I don't have to argue with you. I don't have to feel bad about myself because God has cleansed me. Now, you have, still have to make things right. You still have to deal with it. You still have to, maybe if you have an old habit that keeps coming back, you got to get with a group of people that can help you to walk through it. Maybe you got to go to counseling. Maybe you got to get a group of brothers or sisters to encourage you on that journey. But the truth is, when he says he made you righteous by faith, you can say, God, thank you that you made me righteous. That's from him. Now, this is a great quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer about cheap grace. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. And grace without Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means that in order to follow Christ, you have to realize that we have to have our hearts set right with Him. And realize that sin is serious. In a world that says sin is no big deal, can I tell you to God, it's still a big deal. We need His grace. We've got to put it under His grace. But the truth is, we have to recognize our failures so that we can confess it. Why? So that He can purify our hearts. Number three, confession demonstrates your need for God. 
This is the confidence. Now listen to this. This is opposite almost of what we've been talking about. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. By the way, do you have confidence in approaching God? Well, why can you? He continues. That if we ask anything according to his will, now there's the disclaimer, anything according to his will, God, I want to fly. God's like, "Mm mm-mm, you can barely walk. Why do you want to get up there, right? Anything according to his will, he hears us, and if we know he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. What is this? This is confidence in God's presence. Because of me? No, because of what Christ did for me. So in your bulletin, and if you're watching online, we'll try to attach these later because I didn't, I didn't put these online. I've got 25 faith confessions of believers from God's Word. There's many more than this, but I thought I'd give you a starter kit. So this is a little starter kit of confessions. And if you struggle with the cat filter of I'm nobody, I'm a mess, God hates my guts, uh, I can't come with him, come with him this tw- list of 25 should help you as you pray to spend some time saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He who began a good work in me will carry it out to completion. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. These are just statements about who God has made you. Take some time to read these and don't give in to what the enemy, who the enemy tries to tell you who you are. Sometimes you have to tell the enemy, I'm not a cat. I'm not that old person that I used to be. I still struggle with some of those habits I had before I was a Christian, but I'm a new creature in Christ. I no longer have a cat filter. I am who God made me to be. Do you have an area of your life that you need wisdom? Did you know the Bible says that if you need wisdom, you know what you have to do? It's really complicated. You ready? You have to ask. (gasps) Yeah. How many of you need wisdom in an area of your life, maybe dealing with somebody? Yeah, we all do, right? So... So when's the last time you said, God, would you give me wisdom in this area? The truth is, sometimes we don't ask. We're just trying to figure it out, figure it out, figure it out. And sometimes we need to say, you know what, God, I've been trying to figure this out. Would you just give me wisdom in this area? Sometimes I pray, God, give me your desires in what I should do next. In John 14, Jesus says this, If you love me, keep my commands, and I'll ask the Father, and what? He'll give you another advocate to help you. What does that mean? You're not alone. You have the Holy Spirit to give you power in your heart and in your life and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world can't accept Him because it doesn't see Him or know Him, but you know Him. Why? Because He lives with you and will be in you. When you give your life to Christ, the Bible says the Holy Spirit comes to live in you. That means you can go straight to God for prayer. You you go through Christ because of the blood of Christ. You don't have to come to me to pray. I'm glad for you to give me prayer requests. But the truth is you don't have to come to your priest to pray, to confess. You go to God. Why? Because Jesus gave his blood for you. He is your high priest, it says in the book of Hebrews. So how do you see yourself? See, how you see yourself so often determines how you're going to act. So if you see yourself as just a, uh, I'm just who I am, and I'm always messed up, and I'm always this, and I'm always that, then you're going to act that way. But if you realize I'm a new creation in Christ, God can use me. The Holy Spirit lives in me. He's given me his power. And so even though I've done all these dumb things in my life, guess what? He can give me power now to even make a difference in the lives of others. When's the last time you realize that everywhere you go, that God has given you his light, his power, his spirit? And so begin to walk in it. Don't let the enemy convince you that you're somebody you're not. But you can have confidence before God as you go into this world. One of the reasons for confession is to just see where you're at. We all get off sometimes. There's people today who are doing all kind of horrible things, but because they're, they're all their levels off, they think they're doing great. And other people who, truthfully, if you get around them, you see the grace and love and you realize how godly they are. But what's happened? They believed all these fear and lie and they think that they're all messed up. The truth is, through God's grace, he has made you a child of his with his strength, with his power to make a difference in the world. So take time to confess not only the things where you mess up, but also who you are in Christ. It'll change your prayer life. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that now. If you're watching online, you can do it online. The truth is, I would love to talk to you after the service about what it means. It's very simple. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said he was the only way to God. 
The reason that he died on the cross is because we're all messed up. The truth is, we do have, we were born with a sin nature, a habit to sin. Nobody had to teach your three-year-old to go touch the light socket. We were born with that nature, and so we need forgiveness. And so we know that when we say, Jesus, I turn from my sins, I want to follow you. The Bible says that then the blood of Jesus covers your sins, and that you exchange your old way of living for a new way of life. You get the Holy Spirit to help you walk through the Christian life. So if you want to do that today, you can do that. If you're a Christian and the truth is you haven't taken time to confess and make things right with God lately, hey, make that a daily practice where you keep a clean slate, a clean level with God so you know right where you're at. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, sometimes it's our pride that gets in the way of us knowing where we're really at. Other times, Father, it's things we believe about ourselves where we don't have confidence in your presence. So, Father, forgive us for both of those. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would make us sensitive when we fail and when we falter, that we would confess it to you, confess it to others when we've wronged them. And, Lord, then we would get up and follow you each day. We thank you for these moments. In a world where right is whatever we want to do, we pray that we could deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow you to do what you have called us to do. Lord, I pray if anyone's watching or here today that doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender their hearts and lives to you. Thank you for what you're doing in our church. Thank you for the people who are getting saved, the people who are uh, getting baptized, the people who are making new commitments to serve and to love people. Father, continue to do that in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen.